at Pixar, many of those expenses are totally legit. Scuba diving on Finding Nemo, Ooh. cooking lessons, trips to Paris, pet rats on Ratatouille, <laughs> trips to Scotland on Brave, a field trip to the dump on Toy Story 3. I mean, these are all legitimate actual learning experiences for teams, artists, uh, animators, and filmmakers about what it what it means to be part of a company making movies about the water or the Paris sewers or the Scottish Highlands or, you know, a big finale in the, on Toy Story 3 in the, in the dump. Is this thing on? Yesterday's price is not today's price. Hey, welcome back to Run the Numbers. I'm CJ, your host, and wow, this was cool. We just went deep with Mark Greenberg of Altruist on his experiences as a CFO, and particularly his time as a finance leader at Pixar. Yes, my family is on a big Disney movie kick right now with our two-year-old, so this is very timely. If you don't like Pixar, I mean, who are you? Get reality check here. Talks to the process of budgeting for a movie from start to finish, the cost you have to budget for when it comes to planning for it, uh, the biggest challenges to get it right, when the best movies come out during the year, summer, Christmas, holiday season, and how they decide if they should make a sequel or not. Is there a financial voice at the table saying you should do it or not do it? And then Walt Disney bought Pixar back in 2006. He takes us through what that change was like and the challenges and opportunities of merging the two companies together. And he did run into it, the man, the myth, the legend, Steve Jobs a couple of times. Then we get into Altruist and Money Management. They're a vertical software provider for people who manage other people's money. Yes, I think I got that right. So that's the wealth management space and how it's evolved over time. We talk about some of our favorite metrics, lifetime value, customer acquisition costs, and who he's measuring on each of those sides of the equation. Because it's kind of like a B to B to C or I don't know. You'll find out in this podcast. And then we talk to retention. Uh, finally, we go through CFOs through time. What's the evolution been like over the last four or five years? He actually took the company Blend public in a very different macro environment. So there are some awesome insights here from Mark. All this and much, much more after a short word from our sponsors. What does the future hold for business? Ask nine experts and you'll get 10 answers. Bull market, bear market, rates will rise, rates will fall. Can someone please just invent a crystal ball already? Until then, over 40,000 businesses have future-proofed their companies with NetSuite by Oracle. The number one cloud ERP, bringing accounting, financial management, inventory, HR into one fluid platform. With one unified business management suite, there's one source of truth, giving you the visibility and control you need to make quick decisions. With real-time insights and forecasting, you're peering into the future with actionable data. Whether you're closing the books in days, not weeks, you're spending less time looking backwards and more time on what's next. If you listen to this podcast, you'll know I ask CFOs all the time to rep their tech stacks, and I would say almost every one of them use NetSuite. And that's what I would use too. Whether you're a company earning millions or even hundreds of millions, NetSuite helps you respond to immediate challenges and seize your biggest opportunities. Speaking of opportunity, download the CFO's Guide to AI and Machine Learning at netsuite.com slash metrics. The guide is free to you. That is netsuite.com slash metrics. Ooh, yeah, it's netsuite.com slash metrics. Please, guys, I really need this. Annual planning season is upon us. That's right. My favorite time of year. And it's not just about setting goals for the coming year. It's about ensuring you have the right tools in place to measure and achieve those goals. As a SaaS CFO, I know having access to reliable, real-time metrics is crucial for my annual planning process. That's why I'm so excited to partner with today's sponsor, Maxio. Maxio is a billing and financial operations platform that helps subscription businesses reconcile bookings, billings, gap revenue, and SaaS metrics automatically. By the way, guys, bookings, billings, gap revenue, not the same thing. Got to get them straight. Because these numbers are the foundation of your financial models, it's important to have quick access and trust they are correct. Don't let the complexities of SaaS finance and accounting slow you down. If you want to start 2025 with the right tools, check out Maxio by visiting maxio.com forward slash run the numbers. That's M-A-X-I-O dot com forward slash run the numbers. Request a demo through our link to support the podcast, your boy, and receive a 10% discount on your first year with Maxio. That's maxio.com forward slash run the numbers. M-A-X-I-O dot com forward slash run the numbers. Please, guys, I really need this. 
Mark, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, CJ. It's awesome and an honor to be on here. So I'm really glad I have you on because my family is on a huge Disney movie kick right now with our two-year-old daughter. So this is very timely. And you were at Pixar for 16 years from 2002 through 2018. Before I get to the metrics, what was the best movie that came out in that time period? Oh my gosh. That's like asking which one of your children are your favorite. Uh, it's, not, it's not really fair. Um, but I worked most closely on Ratatouille. So that one really has a special place in my heart. It was, uh, it was overlapping in a time when I moved from the corporate side of Pixar over to the, to the film side. And films are set up sort of like business units, little, little businesses in and of themselves. And so each film had its, effectively its own sort of controller. And we called it a film finance lead. It was a production accountant help with resource allocation and benchmarking and reporting. And it was the accounting side plus the planning. And it was really closely partnered to the, to the producer and director about what, what was being built and how over what period of time. And so I was the production accountant, the film finance lead on, on Ratatouille. So I saw that film in its early, early days all the way through. It's, it's one of the most amazing places to, to be part of. So I'm, it was, it was a huge honor, really smart people, the total pinnacle of their craft. And, you know, one of my best stories from, from Pixar really is I had, I really had an amazing um, boss there. And he, um, you know, I spent a lot of time in, in, a, in the CFO role, a divisional CFO, in a CFO role there. And I, my job was to try and do more with less. And so I spent mm-hmm. a lot of time asking questions about, you know, could the movie be shorter or could it have fewer characters or could it have fewer sets or could it, wow. you know, could we do this faster? Of course, that's very, very difficult to do, in a, especially in a creative endeavor. And so at one point, I was given the honor and the opportunity to produce a short film. So the Blue Umbrella also has a very, very like special place in my heart, if you've ever seen any of the short films. And so I was the, the producer on, on the Blue Umbrella. And really, like, there's a lot of people who helped me through that because I had, I had a day job at the same time. But it created this really amazing, deep empathy for filmmakers. And it, and it generated a, a reasonable amount of credibility. And I think the best thing, one of the best things you can do as a CFO is really understand the product, understand the position you put the customers in, understand that everybody's selling at some point. Everyone has to explain, you know, in an elevator or like in a, in a, in a cocktail party, like, what do you do and what does your company do? With Pixar, it's, it's super easy, but, but it translates. And I think being a storyteller and understanding the arc of storytelling is like, an incredible honor for a CFO if you can you can master that craft. Wow! Uh, and people they knock CFOs saying we're not the creative type. Look at you, you're pro- you're a producer. <laughs> yeah, it, it's don't, don't read into it too much. I have a lot of humility around it. But yeah, no, I was partnered. So with the way that the films work, you partner a producer who's sort of like the CEO of the film with a director who's the creative engine. So I was partnered yeah. with a director who had the idea from very beginning, from uh, from idea generation all the way through its release. In you know, it went on with Monster University in theaters, and it went uh, to the to the Berlin Film Festival, and it went. We were at Annecy, like that experience being front and center on the camera for a, for a, an introvert <laughs> and a CFO yeah. was was very formative and a very. I think it really it helped me a lot. It helped me a ton in in explaining stories and telling stories and engaging an audience and having a beginning and a middle and an end and having visuals to support whatever story you're telling. Yeah, it's it's like telling the company's equity story, right, Mark? Exactly, exactly. It's it's, it's exactly right. It's 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 I'll always be selling ABS, right? Like, <laughs> I, I promise I'll get to the 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 business stuff here. I guess this is a business okay. question. What 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 was like? Maybe if you give me three, what were the top three most successful movies during that time frame? Sequels are always a very powerful, right? People with sequels are there. It's a very strong economic engine. Every sequel has to start out as an original. You know, Toy Story 3 was incredibly, incredibly powerful. And Toy Story 3 was interesting because there are these gaps between the, the, the Toy Story 1 was like in 95 and Toy Story 2 is 99. So they did, then Toy Story 3 was like in 2010, I think. And, and there are gaps in between. And it's almost like people appreciate revisiting the, the intellectual property, the characters, the stories, the, 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 the laughs from when they were kids or when, you know, like, you think about 14 years ago or 10 years ago, you look back on that and you think very nostalgically. And that's some of the appeal 
of sequels. It's very difficult to do, uh, um, a, I think, a very compelling sequel. Pixar's gotten, I think, has gotten it right a bunch of times. And it is it is a strong economic engine. And, and Inside Out was incredibly successful. Toy Story 3 was incredibly successful. I, I'm always, I think Ratatouille is an amazing movie. We've talked about that. But Inside Out, the original, and Ratatouille, the original, and then Toy Story 3 are like... I don't know. Ex- I don't remember exactly which ones did yeah. the most at the box office, but it's it's those were not only compelling stories, but economically successful engines. Those are all bangers. I've, se- I've seen them all. What, <laughs> what? How do they decide if they should make a sequel or not? Is is there a financial voice at the table saying like this makes sense? There is a financial voice at the table because it is a business. It's not a not for profit, but I'd say Pixar has been lucky enough to not let finance, you know, as, as, hum, as with as humility, as I say this, finance doesn't drive the decision-making yeah. um, at a creative, at a creative adventure. It is, it is a voice. And of course people want to m- manage the total, total financial perform- performance of the studio, but you're looking at across a portfolio of, of films and the films are lined up five, six, seven years in advance. So that it's, it's a, yeah, it's a five, it's really a five year, adventure to to make a, an animated film or some that happen a little faster maybe three and a half or four but but some you know brave brave for example was in production for at least six probably seven years i did not re- realize that the lead time w- was that long and so take me through how you square up budgeting for something like that i mean i, I would imagine that the costs uh, that's a pretty big outlay before you actually get money from it it is. It is. It is for sure. It's. It's a. It's a resource allocation problem uh, fundamentally. And so it's funny. I got asked at an altruist event, like, "How did Pixar prepare you to be a you know CFO of a custodian?" <laughs> and I was like, "Well, you, you know, a lot of it has to do with resource allocation. What what resources are we going to dedicate to building what features for what purpose? Right for for gathering assets for for revenue monet- for monetization for uh, surprise and delight." of uh of the advisors or the end consumers so the film starts out as a very small like headcount adventure it's a producer a director a writer a small team of story people and then over time it sort of grows and peaks when you have animation in in full swing and then and then comes down on the other side at release so it's it's fundamentally like it's it's like it's like a giant cost accounting exercise in a lot of ways it's how many characters how many sets how many minutes of animation? How complicated is that animation? How complicated is the lighting? How complicated is the effects? How many iterations do you have on the story? And how much? How many changes do you make over, over the course of time in order to build out what is what is eventually the, the finished product with a release date? Doing an animated film, uh, I would guess it's actually not much cheaper than doing a real life movie because you still have the actors who are voicing over. And I would guess Tom Hanks crushes it as Woody in Toy Story 1. He comes back for Toy Story 2 and 3. You know, price goes up. Yesterday's price is not today's price. Your instincts are exactly right. But I would say that relatively speaking, non for an original movie, relatively mm. speaking, the cost of the actors is very, very small. Most of the cost of the, an animated film is actually the the people that are in the studio working on it, not doing the voices, like doing the, really? the, the animation, doing the lighting, doing the layout, building the characters, building the sets, iterating on the story. That's, that's most of the cost of a film. The cost of the actors, voiceover actors, is, it's relatively small and it's a pretty easy gig, relatively speaking, right? To being on set in the desert, you know, filming because you go into a studio and you, you say the line to infinity and beyond, you know, eight times yeah. and, and then you, and then you do the next line eight times and you do the next line eight times. And then they pick the best version of the, of the line and, and they string lines together, obviously sometimes, but you, you can imagine like we're, the editors are picking the, the best version of that, of that voice uh, acting experience. I didn't know that they were doing it like eight to 10 times over and over again. That's so cool just to get the inside baseball of how that's created. There's some great, when you're watching next time you're watching an animated movie with your kids, go to one of the making of films that, that goes along with on on Disney plus or on a, on one of the DVDs. If if you have those in your house anymore, but go, go to one of the making of it's really, there's some really great insights and it humanizes. I think there's a lot of power in humanizing storytelling and humanizing product building and humanizing the ethos of a company. And I love those behind the scenes stuff and the, the editors, the, 
filmmaking teams do a great job of exposing what it's like inside baseball there. In terms of the financial impact of a movie, uh, you know, businesses have different quirks when it comes to seasonality. Is it true that you try to time the big movies for a summer release? Generally speaking, it's either Christmas or summer. A lot of the, the family films end up in the summertime because the kids are off of school. But Christmas is also a big time. I think a lot of the Lucasfilm, like the Star Wars films and some of the Marvel films have done amazingly well over Christmas. There's a lot, there's a, there are, kids are also off of school and there's, you know, the weather is conducive. I mean, it's funny how much the weather can impact a movie's I initial didn't think about box that. Office. Yeah, rainy day, yeah. snow day, you go to the movies. Exactly, or really hot. Or, or I, I was once part of a conversation around film performance in the UK. So you can imagine film performance in the UK if it's it rains a lot in the UK. But what if what if you have a really beautiful, warm, sunny weekend? Nobody goes to the movies. Everybody wants to be outside. So you can have an amazingly wonderful weekend, and it can actually decrease depress the the box office performance of your film because it was so nice out in the UK. Or pick your other rainy country. That's amazing. I always ask guests about quirks around seasonality and volatility in business models. And like the movie industry was always on my list to ask about. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, repeat viewings are very powerful. When, when, a, when a movie catches the zeitgeist or the ethos of a, of a generation or it crosses generations, like a Toy Story 3, we, we do, we, <laughs> I haven't worked at Pixar for a long time. Pixar, <laughs> Pixar does exit surveys. Who saw the movie? Who loved it? Who's coming back? So when something, it, say, I want to see it again, or it crosses generations or it crosses demographics. Great reviews and strong word of mouth, of course, are super valuable. And there's a, there's a website called Box Office Mojo that we used to track. It's like keeps, try, helps you keep track of what's happening in the various theaters around the world. And it's a reporting aggregator and Disney had their own mechanisms to do reporting, of course, as well. But, you know, the, look at the, the, the drop off week to week. Like the, usually the opening weekend is the biggest weekend. And if a film drops off, more than a certain amount, you make, you make a prediction as to what the eventual box office is going to be. If it drops off less than a certain amount, that's a really good sign. It has strong legs, strong word of mouth, strong repeat viewership. And if, if, if it's not, if an animated movie, for example, is not all parents with their kids, that's a really good sign. And Toy Story 3 was, you know, adults without their kids and adults with their kids. So you saw that in the same, in the same theater on the exit, on the exit interviews, on the exits. So. Anyway, it's it's fascinating industry. It's and super fascinating. The data, the data is there, and home video has had a huge impact, of course, on and what streaming has done to the impact of the overall financial profile of a film and what consumer products can do to a film. Right? You think about a movie like Ratatouille it doesn't have a very strong consumer products angle, but a movie like Cars is like a lifestyle change for children, right? For boys, especially, but boys and girls for sure. But so there's, there's, there's a consumer products angle that, that is very unique to cars. That is, you wouldn't experience with a film like Ratatouille. Hey, thanks for listening. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. Okay. Serious question for all my accounting pros here today. Are you doing what you were hired to do? What I mean is, do you have time to actually be a business partner or are you buried in tedious manual tasks just to get your journal entries prepared every month. I know how that feels. LeapFin's here to help with that. LeapFin is accounting automation software that automatically prepares and posts reliable journal entries. And that's just the beginning. High growth businesses like Reddit, Canva, and Seeky choose LeapFin to eliminate manual tasks, accelerate month end close, and enable accounting leaders like you to provide faster insights that will help your company grow. If you're battling messy transaction data from Stripe, Adyen, Shopify, Apple Pay, and other PSPs, and then battling again to get it all into NetSuite, go to leapfin.com to watch their short product intro video. And if you like what you see, request a 15 minute conversation to learn how accounting automation can help you and your team. Check out leapfin.com today. That's leap like jump, fin like shark. I just made that up. I hope they're okay with it. Leapfin.com. As a CFO, I can say firsthand that the most important thing to know is how money enters and leaves the building, full stop. Without a simple and easy to monitor financial system, you're flying blind. And I'm the kind of guy who likes to have all my tools in one place. I'm talking checking accounts, bill pay, credit cards, and everything else I need to run a business. I'm pumped that Mercury is both a sponsor of this podcast and a safe place to keep my cash. It sure beats keeping my cash under my mattress again. Plus it looks slick. I always get angry when back office tools are ugly, newsflash. 
Finance people may wear both a belt and suspenders to work, but we like stuff that looks good too. Sorry, I just had to get that off my chest. Mercury simplifies your financial operations with powerful banking, giving you greater control, precision, and speed so you can operate at your best. Make the switch today, like I did. Tell them your boy CJ from Run the Numbers sent you. Mercury is a financial technology company, not a bank. Banking services provided by Choice Financial Group and Evolved Bank and Trust. Members, FDIC. I'm so glad you brought that up because I was going to ask, uh, movie viewership isn't the only revenue line, right? Like you can That's sell right. merchandise against the, the movie. Yeah, merchandise... I don't know exactly what the numbers are for cars, but I would I would bet that the merchandise numbers are many times what the box office was. Yeah, I I mean my daughter, the kids that she hangs out with, they all have cars stuff, and I don't even think that movie came out when they were born, which is crazy. So that just shows that it has <laughs> staying power. I'm thinking about the That's retention right. curve here. <laughs> exactly, the retention curve is incredibly strong, and 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 Disney is really smart about 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 attaching themselves to really strong IP and and having it live on in the parks and having it live on in other stories. And I mean, there's some episodic com- content you can imagine on Disney plus, right. Related to inside out or monsters or cars. And those things are, there was a bunch of toy story short films, you know, toy story of terror and like a bunch of others that really were great little stories. Some worked for TV, some were for streaming, some were for the DVD or home video release. And having that that content refresh itself a little bit can be very powerful, and to be able to repeat watch, you know, for the parents and the kids, right? In some cases, but but I think there's layers to Pixar that get underappreciated, right? Like so much sophisticated content in a in a film that 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 generations pick up on, you know, cross cultural references, and th- th- I mean, the filmmakers are trying to make movies that they want to see too, right? Or they want to take their kids to. Yeah, there's a really strong appeal to that, and the the creative process at Pixar is also really interesting because it's almost like a like a recommitment ceremony in some ways because the movies show in in whatever state they're in they sh- they screen for the studio and for the other directors and for each other well, like what the what the state of the film is and whatever state it is three four every three or four months and so there's a process of being of seeing the progress over time and is that story getting better is it is it re- resonating more is it is it still funny is it heartfelt is it is it is it believable but not real right like real movies are are documentaries and real movies are home video you know you know what you record on your iphone um but but having something be believable and and grounded in the world in it whatever what you live in a car's world or in a toy story world so that you don't get get shocked out of it is also very uh, like I think a very compelling and, and meaningful goal. Totally. Mark, you, you mentioned Disney and the economic engine that it is. You were there when they bought Pixar in 2006. What, what was that like? I'm a, I'm a huge fan of, of Bob Iger and his leadership and just the, the power of culture, I think was really compelling to me. The agreement between Steve Jobs and Bob Iger to work mm. to preserve the cultural and creative magic and that, entrepreneurial, creative, innovative spirit that was built into Pixar's culture. And re- realizing that things would change, of course, but how do you invase, in, in, embrace that change, right? While preserving the ability to tell these amazingly meaningful and, and cross-generational and cross-cultural stories. So I think it was really well done. I think it was really thoughtfully done. I think that it comes down to kind, creative, thoughtful, empathetic leaders. And the the respect that Disney had for what Pixar had built over time, and what what Steve had led, and what the team there had been had been doing, and the the break between the prior Disney administrations of Eisner and whatever, and then the transition to Bob, and what he meant to like building building a, a creative company together that had all these amazing uh, storytellers, these amazing intellectual property, and and Pixar helped with some innovation at Disney animation and helped them with some stories that that they were working on. And then, you know, years later, Disney acquires Lucasfilm. So what, what it meant to George Lucas to pass along his story, his stories and his history over to Disney under the, under what, what Disney had arranged with, with Pixar was really, I think it was just a, it was just a great, I'm very appreciative and, and humbled by the opportunity to be part of something like that. And you talk about merch sales, the Star Wars Lucasfilm <laughs> sales. Wow, that that's incredible. 
Yeah, that I mean, I mean the George Lucas's uh, foresight to hold on to that to the merchandising. Yeah, what, what was that deal? I've heard I've heard anecdotally about that. Didn't he yeah. carve out like a really smart deal ahead of time? He, he I, I don't know exactly the story, yeah. but um, but the lore, it, the what I understand is that he 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 was willing to share lots of things, but he wanted to retain the rights to merchandise. And that turned out to be like the most powerful and the most profitable part of, of the Star Wars franchise. Wow. Yeah. Great move by him. Business guy and a creative. Okay. I could do about three hours on Disney and Pixar, but I'll, I'll move right on, on here. Right on. Right, Thank right. you. Well, well, it's, well, well, it, yeah. One more question. I got to ask one more. Go did you ever meet, did you ever meet Steve Jobs? I did. I did. I ne- I didn't, I wasn't lucky enough to be like interacting with him on a daily basis, but he was, yeah. when, by the time I got to Pixar in 2002, he was at the studio on Fridays. So my interactions were very, very limited, but he was, a, he was a force and he's a, an amazing, he was an amazing leader and amazing guy. And I think, I think that at least at the experience at Pixar, you know, stories of his, his, you know, the other side, I guess, mm-hmm. that people talk about in the Walter Isaacson book, we, I, I never experienced and I never observed. So I, I think I have a lot of respect for what he did yeah. and, and his perseverance when it came to Pixar. Totally. A lot of perseverance. Okay. Let's talk about altruist and money management. Yeah. And so uh, this is my very simple way of trying to explain it. You can, you can pick up the pieces. Please. You, ser- you serve the people who manage other people's money. Is that right? That is exactly right. Think about when I, when I talk about this at cocktail parties, I talk about, uh, imagine Shopify for financial advisors. So like you're a financial advisor and you don't want to be part of a big warehouse like a UBS or a Morgan Stanley or whatever. And you want to go out and open up your own RIA, your, your own independent advisory firm. And you want to be an independent advisor. You need the infrastructure to be able to build and run that practice. You know, portfolio management, data analytics, trading, you know, performance reporting, document or e-signature, like all the things that you would need to do to run your practice. That's what, that's what Altos provides. We're trying to be a modern custodian built exclusively for RAs and we're self-clearing. You, we have digital account opening, rebalancing, you know, we're, we're trying to be what it means to be the, the there are a lot of incumbents in this space, right? The, the Schwab's and the fidelities of the world. We're trying to be a vertically integrated company that that really just focuses on built by served purpose for RIAs. Kind of like the operating system for wealth managers. Exactly. That's exactly right. We're an operating system for wealth managers. And we're trying to differentiate ourselves from the legacy custodians by doing by by having it be a digital first. And and it's funny, we talk about we're going to talk about metrics, I'm sure, but one of the things we do we do track internally is is how many accounts are on our platform that are under ten thousand dollars. And that's very unique, right? Like most most of traditional advisors want to move up the market. They want to serve larger and larger clients because it's much easier to serve a larger client, high net worth individual in a lot of ways. Some things will eventually get hard are eventually harder depending on what your investment strategy is. But but generally speaking, we want to celebrate our ability to have no account minimums, serve smaller advisors, serve smaller account holders. And we think that there's a gap in the market there. Now we're, we're building our platform to, to be a modern alternative for larger advisors too, for larger firms as well. But, but we think that the smaller advisors are an especially underserved part of the market. Yeah. It's kind of like uh, where the frontier stops. It's like you have all these people who are trying to run a successful business, but they probably didn't make economic sense for the way that these incumbent companies were built. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And there are a lot of point solutions out there, and it's very hard to figure out how to how to build out your stack. You know, you 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 know, there are all these software solutions for financial planning, for performance reporting, for data analytics. You want to you want to add four hundred one ks. You want to have a CRM. Like you want to try and do compliance. Like all those things, bringing all those things together as a sole pre- as a sole practitioner is next to impossible. But even as a smaller firm, a five advisor firm or a 10 advisor firm, it can be very complicated and burdensome to try and operate as an advisor. And then you're, you're not spending as much time serving your clients, which then right. reflects who you, who you do business with. There's like something like only one third of the people who want financial advice are actually getting financial advice. Wow. And so we can expand the market 
we can serve the market for sure. And it is a very large market. There's $10 trillion probably in, in RIAs. But to be able to serve the people that are not getting uh, advice today, results, there was a Vanguard study, you know, there, there's like a, there's a, a measurable difference between people that get advice and people that don't, the people that work with a financial advisor and people that don't. Um, and I think that, you know, the Robin Hoods of the world are serving a market, but we think that there's an opportunity to serve the advisor market in a way that has consumer quality features in a in an advisor in a in a commercial solution in a B two B to C solution. So, how do you think about I guess the definition of a customer and then the lifetime value of a customer? Is is the, your customer the wealth manager or is it like CJ who has his money in in one of the accounts? I'm going to, I'm going to cheat a little bit here. I'm going to, I'm going to say yes. And right. Like okay. our goal is to have impact at both levels. We want to be able to demonstrate that your advisor is more productive and your, you do better performance wise by working with an altruist as a custodian. We're going to, we're trying to, you know, fully fractional share trading. We want to, we want to make sure that you can only have to hold a little bit of cash. If you only want to hold a little bit of cash, we want to make sure that cash earns a high rate. We have a high yield savings account. It's earning, you know, up until the Fed move, it was earning 5.1. Now it's at 4.6, but it's still very high relative to what you're probably you probably could get at a at a, a large at a large bank or in your checking account or in or in the, in the attached savings account that exists. Um, at I mean, I'm comparing. I'm on I'm at B of A, right? Like my I'm, I think my B of A savings account gets like 10 basis points, right? Like it's right. it's really not a not a productive use of my cash. So. Our goal is to have impact at both levels. We want to allow allow those advisors to serve customers at any level, no account minimums, like I said, better performance reporting, tax loss harvesting, higher yield on cash, fully fractional share trading, low transaction fees. And, and if we can do that, to your point about retention, it's a decades long relationship that we can build, super low turnover. And, and everybody's uh, uh, goals are a lot, very closely aligned, right? Like you want to grow your account. Your advisor probably wants to grow their book and we want to grow our assets under management. So they're like, we're, there's some, some nice alignment. We can find the Venn diagram that has, you know, good for account holders, good for advisors and good for altruists. We're trying to find that, find that sweet spot. And I guess how you know you're really sticky is if somebody switches from one wealth manager to the other, but the underlying uh, custodian of their assets remains with altruists. That would, that would be, that would be amazing. That would, if you, and it'd be amazing if you, if you selected, I don't know whether this would, would ever happen, right? Like it's like, it's, I don't know if you know the term ingredient brand, right? Like, mm. um, ingredient brand is like Intel inside, right? Like remember the advertisement for Intel? It's like the little, ding, 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 the little jingle. It's like I'm looking you at the buy sticker it. on my computer right now. Yeah. You want to, you want to buy a computer that has Intel inside because Intel is as trusted trusted brand dolby right like dolby is an interesting ingredient brand and you want to you people buy we're buying cassettes and go to theaters like oh dolby vision dolby xd dolby like that's that says that the sound system the sound quality is going to be amazing and i hope someday that 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 altruist advisors will will promote the idea that oh wow i'm an altruist advisor you can trust altruist we're a we're subject to the same rules that every other custodian is subject to, FINRA, SIPIC, every insurance. And you get better results by work. You have a better experience. Your computer works better or your sound quality is better because you work with altruists. And it sounds like uh, there's an element of lended credibility too, right? Like you go to a movie uh, because y- you know it's going to be a good show based on what they're advertising as that ingredient. I'd never heard that term before. It's fascinating. Oh, right on. Right. Yeah. I hope, I mean, we, we haven't done any direct, it's, it's a bug, it's a bug and a feature in a lot of ways, right? Like people haven't heard of altruists because we don't have a retail presence, right? The reason why people have, people have heard of Schwab, part of the reason they've heard of Schwab is that Schwab markets to the retail customer, which isn't actually a channel conflict to the advisor. We don't have that channel conflict. Now we're, we haven't been around for 50 years, right? We haven't been, we haven't, we haven't spent any money, you know, promoting our, our brand in that way. But it is a bug and a feature. Like we we are built for RIAs, which also means we don't have a retail presence, which means we don't compete with you for your customer. I'm not I'm not I'm not going to go to your customer and say, hey, listen, if you want to go direct to Schwab, you know that's that's well within your rights. 
you can't go direct to Altruist. We are for advisors by advisors. And Mark, you'd mentioned retention and that it's uh, historically strong within this sector. And I've, and I've heard the same. How does that impact your thinking around customer acquisition cost? It allows us to be long-term thinkers. And I think it's, if you have the opportunity to meet Jason, our founder, you'll, you'll, you'll see his long-term thinking immediately, right? Like this is, it's so interesting to think about. He was a software engineer, then he became an advisor. He built up an RIA practice. He then sold it. He then started building tools for advisors and decided that he was going to try and go the full vertical stack to build out the, 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 the fully digital custodian. And he's been thinking about what it means to be built, you know, purpose built for RIAs over the long term, like his practically his whole career. And so we think about retention, we think about investing in the customer. It's funny, I, I you know, I've, you probably have followed like Costco and Walmart, right? Like Costco has the opportunity periodically, probably to, to get better margins, right? But they focus on lower margin and, and best possible cost because they're making an investment in the long-term relationship with the customer. And I, I think about that. We're not, we're not, I'm not saying that we're Costco in any way, but I think about like the commitment that we're making to customers and advisors, advi- both advisors and their, their account holders over the longer term. And I, I think that we, we're trying to make a commitment. We'll have simply better pricing. We'll have the, we're going to keep investing in the best possible technology. We're going to, we're going to be trusted brands. So we're going to try and earn your trust by having great customer service and having infrastructure that's, that's, that's rock solid, right? Like we're built on, uh, AWS in the cloud, nothing on prem. Like when, you know, when the, when the yen unwound or when they're, when they're crazy things happening in the market, we're, we're up because we're, we can expand our, our digital footprint fairly easily relative to on-prem software. And I think this is the modern, this is the modern version. Altruist is the modern version of what a custodian can be, which is to be flexible on infrastructure, to be bulletproof and solid, to be fully secure with two-factor authentication and all the AML and KYC and all the things you would do and also be um, customer focused. It definitely seems like the puck is going that way and you're in your prize to capitalize on that. When, when you were talking about uh, Costco, it reminds me, uh, I think it was Sam Walton and then Jeff Bezos stole it, but the quote was that your margin is my opportunity. And it's yeah. the same thinking that like the founders of Ikea had. Like I never want to be thought of as a low cost brand because that's just competing on one vector. I want to be thinking of the most value for what you're paying for. Exactly, exactly, exactly. How do you think about retention over time? What are the metrics you look at and, and how often, over what periods do you measure them? We've only been self-clearing for a relatively short period of time, but we want to have 99% plus retention over over decades. And we're doing everything we can to serve our customers in a way that makes them feel like, Hey, if we made a mistake, we're going to admit to that mistake fairly quickly. We're going to fix it. We're going to make do right by you, even if it wasn't entirely our fault. I mean, in some cases, we're, we're dependent on vendors. And I, I'm not trying to make an excuse either. Like your relationship is with Altruist. And if we have a vendor that doesn't do yeah. what it's supposed to do and you have a, a problem, we're going to make it, we're going to make you whole on that. And I've been there too. Like as a CFO of a vertically integrated marketplace business, a lot of times shit happens and it's, Technically not your fault, but guess what? The customer's yours, so it is your fault. And they don't care it that matter. it's somebody else. Like the excuse carries no weight with them. <laughs> I know. It just, they just had a bad experience. And when you're talking about money, right? Like your financial life, people take that stuff super seriously, right? Like you have to be able to know you can trade at any time. You know exactly what the balance is in your accounts at any time that it's, you know, this is, this is people's retirements and livelihoods and college savings and wedding savings and, you know, big vacation savings. And like, these are, these are important life moments and you want to make sure that those, you know, we saw that we see all the advertisements on, <laughs> on TV all the time for your, you know, for the pick your financial advisor. Like this is a long-term relationship and you want to build, you want to build on trust. Yeah, it is a long-term relationship and it is so valuable uh, and it retains so well. It, it reminds me of like uh, the only other industry I can think of that may have like a higher, uh, ability to pay for a customer would be like the pharmaceutical industry of how there's like, they always talk about the keywords that get bid up for some drug that you've never heard of just because it's worth so much. You know, the, we're having a little bit of a debate internally about 
to what extent do we market to the end consumer versus market to the advisor? And they've, the end consumer is the relation is is the advisor's relationship. It's not our relationship. But no, there there has there have been some items where like our high yield cash product where we've done some very limited in app uh, notifications to the end consumer. And some advisors are okay with it, and some advisors really don't like that. And we want to respect what those advisors want us to do. And we've we're not doing a lot of it really, but, but it is interesting to think about the, like, to me, it's almost like a, like the drug advertisement, like ask your doctor about yeah. moment guard, whatever, as like, ask, ask your, your advisor, advisor about altruist, ask your advisor about altruist high yield cash account. <laughs> it's funny though. Cause I wanted to ask you about that, Mark. Like it, you, you, you could have went the white label route, right? Like we're the operating system for investment professionals and you just think it's their software. So some companies do go that route. Uh, yeah. I, I know I was telling you before the call started that I, I have some money in Altruist and I knew that even though I went through a wealth manager. So it, it was a, it was a, a cognizant choice. It was, it was. And some of it is regulatory. You have to know who your custodian is. So it's, I don't, I don't totally know like what's required regulatorily, but it's a good point. It's not that different actually. Like when you look at a, not to go back to animated movies, but you yeah. look at Disney presents and a Pixar animated studios film, Steve was always very adamant that Pixar had its own brand. And if you look at the font sizes, you'll notice that the font sizes are exactly alike. And that is a legacy of Steve Jobs saying they have to be exactly alike. So I, I, I don't think that that's how it came to be. I don't know what was what the thinking was around building an Ultras brand, but I do yeah. think the trusted ingredient brand behind the advisor that you trust is something that we believe can be is is powerful. Yeah, I mean, I, I've probably gone through about fifteen Lenovo's, and I love the Intel <laughs> chip inside. So some, something's working. Ingredient brand that that besides all the animated stuff, like uh, <laughs> that's going to really stick with me. So that's awesome. Right on. Hey, listen to um. I think there there's a podcast. I, am I allowed to plug other podcasts on your podcast? Oh, of course. Okay, sorry. If sorry, if I'm violating anything. No, you, no. You get, I, get, I, you, I I'm a huge consumer of podcasts. So right on. So it. there's a there's a podcast called Business Breakdowns. Yeah. And Business Breakdowns does a podcast on Dolby. I think I'm pretty sure as a as one of the most powerful ingredient brands of all time. Nice. I'm gonna check that one out. Mark, I want to talk about CFOs through time. So break right it on. down. How do you feel about being a CFO now versus four or five years ago? Oh wow! I think the biggest thing, and I'm, I, I'm I hate to bring up something so obvious, but AI is really changing the office of the CFO. Right? Automation of routine tasks, advanced financial analytics, hopefully better decision making, maybe better fraud detection and compliance. The 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 the, the power that is that is at our finger, fingertips today really is is growing exponentially and i i think that we have to be we have to appreciate what it means to be able to be on the forefront here and see how powerful these tools are and how do we make sure that we are adding value at every moment and we routine we 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 cut out the the things that we can cut out the cut out and i love the idea of asking a technologist every time we we try and do something else i want to talk to someone who says well can we do this with AI. Yeah. Uh, Klarna recently in the news said that they were actually getting rid of Salesforce and I saw something that. else. And I thought that, whoa, that's a bold move. Like, are we really mm -hmm. there yet? Yeah, we're not there yet, in, you know, and in, in my experience, but we are, we're thinking about how we can grow, scale the company mm -hmm. without scaling the finance team. And uh, I mean that with all the respect in the world, right? Like, how, yeah. how do we make sure that our small accounts payable team scales as quickly as possible by using OCR, by using yeah. automated coding, by doing uh, automated reviews before it gets to the FP&A team to evaluate what's been, what's the budget versus actual. And how do we look at what vendors, you know, how do we teach that system, what vendors go in what buckets um, so that we have accurate uh, uh, reporting. So yeah, getting, getting that information in people's hands very quickly fully accurately in a way that they can consume it, right? Like in a visual, right? Like where they can click and, and drill down into the details if they have a question about what's in professional fees, right? Like as an example, right? Because yeah. it just happened to me this morning, right? Like 
like, how do you, how do you make sure that you understand, okay, are those one-time costs or are those mm. ongoing costs? Are they professional fees because of an audit? Are they professional fees because we had to redo something or because the operations team needed some additional help? So how do you break that down and make a very small accounts payable team, a very small FP&A team, a very small, right, like team generally, really productive and really like impactful to the organization? Folks, that's a true CFO calling out the ever nebulous professional services bucket. <laughs> if you know, you know. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. It uh, happened to me this morning. Yeah, we've all been there. Uh, <laughs> what did What did you learn from taking Blend public in a very different macro environment? Uh, I, I, people tell you what it's like to take company public, but I think living it changes your view. IPO is uh, is a first step. It's like the the engagement party on a marriage. You know, like you still have to do the wedding, and then you have that to. That is so funny. That is so funny because we talked to we talked to the CFO Amanda Whalen of Clavio two weeks ago, and she said an IPO. I haven't like listened to that school. one yet. She said, a high, uh, uh, it's like high school graduation. Like you, you made it to this milestone. We still got to grow up a lot and mature after. <laughs> yeah. That's good though. That's good. Thank you. I, um, I think it's so important to have your growth trajectory well mapped and that you spend time thinking about what could go wrong in the macro environment. You know, can interest rates go up more quick, way more quickly than you possibly imagined? And I think there's real power in a pre-mortem. What, what's a, what's a pre-mortem? I haven't, I've heard of post-mortem. So a pre-mortem is like, what, what I've used a pre-mortem for is like, it's like, it's like a, you, before you do the thing, you think about what could go wrong and you sort of pre-game all the things that could make this thing not be successful or be successful. Okay. What does success look like? What does success not look like? And then what are the things that could happen that could lead to our success or lead to our our failure, our disappointment with the results. So it's literally like having a postmortem before you get to the thing you're doing. It's like leaving no stone unturned. Like uh, if something could go wrong, what do we think would go wrong? Yeah. Yeah. I always, I always think of Mike Tyson, right? Like everyone gets, has a plan to get punched in the mouth. Sure. So how do you make sure that you know what it's going to feel like if you get punched in the mouth and what are you going to do when you do? Cause, mm. cause eventually you will. And it's, so what happens when, when customers react differently than you expect? What happens if the software or the product doesn't work the way you expect? What happens if you get bad press or especially good press? Like, what does that look like for you when you, when you, when you launch something? And um, how do you make sure that you're well prepared? Do you have a contingency plan that allows you to react in the moment when things are, are going sideways? And are you prepared? Who are you going to call? When are you going to involve the board? Uh, who, what other CFOs do you know have been through this before? Who's covering the Saturday morning, like when you can't get in touch with someone? Um, and and tr- translating that into into a, conting- into a set of contingencies it can be incredibly powerful. And everybody talks about the lead up to an IPO where there's a ton of learnings, but I would, I don't know, I would venture to guess that it's actually after the IPO that you probably learn even more. Yeah, I mean, there, there. I think there are learnings all throughout the process. It is, it is a comprehensive learning, and you have a lot of people that. There's a lot of people out there that have been through it before. Our attorneys and our bankers were super valuable. The team from Wilson Sonsini was amazing. They, they really, they've been through it way more times than than we have. And I just think when you're inside a company, that it's there's a lot of there's a lot of you can only have so many of those in your in your lifetime in your yeah, career. Yeah, right. You only have so and, but, so many at bats. You've seen it once, maybe twice if you're lucky. Exactly. And and when you have lawyers and accountants and and advisors and bankers that can help you through it and you trust them and they are forthcoming and everyone is working with good purpose, right? Like how do you make sure that everyone's working, you understand where the motivations are? I think there's so much to be learned all along the way. Post IPO, how do you engage with investors? What investors do you do you engage with? How much how much of a pop is okay, right? Like, is too much of a pop, you know, bad? Maybe. Is too little a pop bad? Maybe. But there's lessons in, in every aspect of it. I can't remember exactly who it was, so forgive me. But one of the CFOs we had on the show, when we talked about advice, he said, always pick the higher priced advisors. Don't cheap out on them. Because if they're charging a higher price, it's actually probably signal that they really know it and can add value. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I, I don't, there's a lot of money changes hands in and around an IPO, <laughs> and it, it was sometimes it was hard to it's hard as a CFO to yeah. sort of like squint your eyes and be like, "Whoa, geez, you're taking what percent?" Okay, yeah. but I agree. Like, there is a lot of a lot of people that have been through this many times, and they are super knowledgeable. And we leveraged we leveraged the, the capital markets teams that are our investors like everybody working together with good purpose. And that was a super rewarding experience and one that I learned so much from. What advice would you give to CFOs today who are stepping into the role for the first time in in the current environment? I think that everything comes down to people. Hire the best people, give them runway, trust them, support them. Who you surround yourself with is so, is, is more important than anything else. I would encourage them to ask the difficult questions and that, that to use data when they do ask the difficult questions and people see the transparency and the trust being built when you do ask difficult, sometimes unpopular questions about the forecast, the model, the, the, uh, the productivity of the engineering team. So I think the people, and I always talk about sort of a fearlessness around asking difficult questions. That's great. And it, it kind of tees me up for my next one here, which I ask a lot. And it's what qualities do you think separate the good CFOs from the great CFOs? I have to go back to that conversation we were having maybe, I don't know, 20 or 30 minutes ago around storytelling. I think the best CFOs are amazing storytellers. Mm. And they can tell the story to the company to make it compelling. They can tell the story to the, their employees that makes retention possible or the people that they hire that draws them to their story. They, they engage with customers in a really compelling storytelling way and you're, you're storytelling to investors. And I think that that, that I've always admired the, the, the CFOs who, who have this amazing breadth of, of, of experience and can really, you know, in a super compelling way, tell an amazing story. Pixar background is going to help with that. Right on <laughs> <laughs> a little bit, a little bit of bias there. <laughs> maybe. Uh, Mark, I'm going to take you into what we call our long ass lightning round. Okay. So first question I got for you, you're a successful guy, but you got to give it to me. What's something you've messed up in your career? could be either on this job or a different one. So I'm sure I screw stuff up all the time. The the best thing you can do is, is take a moment and figure out what you learned and what you can teach from that moment. And what would you do differently next time? I think the oftentimes I'm, I'm, most critical of myself when I don't give feedback in the moment. Feedback is a gift. You have to review it as a gift. And you have, the only way you're going to get better as a team or as an individual is to, is to provide feedback in the moment, even if it's, if it's hard to stomach. So for me, it's, uh, it's being better as a manager. Yeah, I've often held my tongue in a spot where I should have given feedback. And then later, I resent the fact that I didn't, like when the person does it again, like why are they doing it again? It's like, oh, well, I didn't do them any service of actually telling them. Yes. All right. Uh, if you could tell your younger self something, knowing what you know today, what would you tell them? I would first say it's okay to be patient. Mm. I didn't know it was going to work out. Don't don't rush. Think about experiences. When I when I went to Pixar, um, it was a pretty lateral move, but I thought the company was amazing. And then I did another kind of lateral move within within Pixar in order to get experience as a, another part of the finance organization. And I think that patience really, I, I could have been more patient because I'm sure I was stressing in the moment, but, I, but over the long term, you have a long career, you have plenty of time, be patient. And, and the second, I, if I can drop a second one in is. Yeah. That's why it's a long ass lightning round. It can go long. Yeah, I, I can go around relationships. I think the again, again, like the people aspect of this relationships matter a ton. I've, gained and lost touch with too many people over the years. And I would, I would, I would tell my younger self to hold on to more of those relationships because there's, I worked with some amazing people over the years and I, uh, I keep saying, I'm going to go reach out to them and thank them, you know, uh, uh, an advisor or a professor, uh, uh, a coworker and people have had incredible impact on me. And I think, I think those relationships are what makes us different from the, you know, the, the primates, maybe, I don't know. I love that. So I, I think when I was 30, I said, this year, I'm going to write letters to teachers who like had a big mm-hmm. impact on me. Like I, they, they've really helped me get to this point. 
of course, I put it on the back burner for like two more years. And then <laughs> I finally did it because I was like, I don't think I'm ever going to thank these people or it was similar to you, like losing contact with them. Like I would love to say hello again. And uh, the the letters that they sent me back, like kind of blew my mind of just like how, mm. how happy they were that somebody reached out. And I often think that way in my career, like there are people who have helped me a lot or I just really enjoyed working with them. And now I'm like, oh, wow, it's been like eight years or nine years or whatever. And uh, I'm like, has it been too long? But I think like, I think that's going to be another goal of mine to reach back out to people that I haven't talked to in a while who I enjoyed working with. Good for you. That's amazing. Really powerful. Those relationships were so powerful. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Can you walk me through your finance software stack? What's the most recent tool you bought? Zone Capture for OCR to try and enhance our accounts payable productivity and make sure that help us get better at getting things in the right buckets to my earlier point. We we upgraded from QuickBooks to NetSuite as we got more sophisticated. We use Mosaic for our FP&A team. We use Carta for equity. And we use Brex for our corporate cards. And we use a lot of Excel and Google Sheets and Google Slides. Yeah. Like everybody else, I'm sure. They'll have to take it out of my cold dead hands. <laughs> right. A lot of a lot of friends of the pod on there though. That was great. Okay. Last one I got for you. What's the craziest thing you've ever had someone try to expense? This is this is I've got the best answer for this one because oh. at Pixar, oh. many of those expenses are totally legit. Scuba diving on Finding Nemo, Ooh. cooking lessons, trips to Paris, pet rats on Ratatouille, <laughs> trips to Scotland on Brave, a field trip to the dump on Toy Story 3. I mean, these are all legitimate, actual learning experiences for teams, artists, uh, animators, and filmmakers about what it, what it means to be part of a company making movies about the water or the Paris sewers or the Scottish Highlands or, you know, a big finale in the, on Toy Story 3 in the, in the dump. That is amazing. Okay. I'm never going to look at an expense report the same way after that. <laughs> Maybe they're doing background research. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Background research is very important. Mark, uh, thank you so much for being gracious thank to your you. time. This was an absolute blast for me. It's an honor. Thank you so much, CJ. You're doing great work. Run the Numbers is a mostly LLC production. Yelling an intro by Fat Joe. Artwork by some AI thingamajig. Podcast and video editing is done by CleanCast at cleancast.io. Nothing said on this podcast is intended to be business or investment advice. It's the sole opinion of me, a guy who feeds his dog too much ice cream and has a history of net operating losses, lol. If you like this podcast, please hit subscribe. It would mean a lot to me. And also check out MostlyMetrics.com. That's my newsletter where I explore business models and financial metrics. Thanks for riding with me. Share this with your friends. Peace.